Today, I will try to complete the repair of this Arkham AVR 280, which I started repairing on my previous video. Hello the internet and uh, welcome back to my channel. This is the continuation of a previous video which you can find linked in the description and which I recommend watching first if you want to see the whole journey. Now just to recap the events, I got this receiver which seemed to be working fine besides some hum noise on the outputs. I disassembled the unit and found lots of bad capacitors on the motherboard. I replaced as much of them as I could uh, but when I reassembled the unit, it would not power up at all, and further diagnostic led to damaging one of the amplifier board in the unit. By the end of the video, I realized that some traces were cracked on the motherboard, and after fixing them, the unit came back to life, but it was still powered off by itself for no apparent reason. So, time to continue this journey and fix this unit. Let's pick this up from the damaged amplifier board. Right, let's move to good news. Um, I think the fact that now this board here is faulty has given me an answer on how the protection line works on the system. Now, if you will look at the schematics very, very real quick, um, I think I found that basically we have this VDET, uh, which I think is voltage detection and CU DET current detection which is basically some circuitries uh, reading voltage and currents from the system. The outcome is coming to this little circuit here. There's a Zener diode at 5.1 volts here. I think there's 20 volts um, going in. Actually, no, it's, it's V plus, so it's 53 volts going in. There must be some comparison through, through these transistors. And what happens if, if something is not right, there's, uh, there's an output which is prot, protection, I suppose, which is going to AMP2 board, but from the AMP2 board, it's basically going to the motherboard. The AMP2 doesn't do anything, it's just a link. From what I can see, that's the only way the motherboard has to realize whether the amplifiers are in trouble or not. Now, the protection line is coming through from the other amplifier into this connector here and then there's another connector down here get the go that goes on the motherboard now i have the meter here set to dc and what i'm going to do i'm going to probe my protection line remember that right now this amplifier board is connected which means the amplifier will switch off almost immediately i mean it's a few seconds it says initializing then it shuts down so let me give power to this thing and let's see what this reads okay three two one go there you go 4.9 and there you go and it went to standby what I'm going to do, I'm going to disconnect this black connector here, which powers this board here. Basically, I'm taking this board out of the equation. Let me probe again the protection line and give power to the unit and see what it says with this amplifier board not powered this time. So, three, two, one, go. You there it is, it goes straight to zero. And the unit is powering up as usual, at least it's trying, and then eventually it just powers off. But it, it takes more time, it actually boots up, it says CD-ROM and blah, blah, blah. And then sometimes it shuts down, actually it goes into standby after a few seconds, a bit more, a bit less, that depends. So that is telling me that the protection line has to be, well, low to be okay. This is also telling me that this board is fine because if that board hadn't been fine, I would have had five volts there. And this is telling me something very important. It is not the amplifier board to shut down or to put the standby the whole amplifier. The only way the electronics has to know whether there's an issue with the amplifiers is, if I'm reading the drawings correctly, through the protection line. And we notice that when the protection line is 5 volts, the unit shuts off in the, almost immediately, while when I have only this one connected, it actually tries to power up. This is telling me the reason is it is shutting down doesn't depend on the amplifiers. So I was having a look at the schematics and I found something very interesting. Right, let's follow for a moment this protection line, which says it's going to amp to board. And you see here that from uh, amp one to amp two, it simply goes through. 
So he goes through and he goes to the motherboard. So let's have a look where he goes on the motherboard. And here we are on the motherboard, but you see this port, uh, which I, um, I am 99% sure that this is misspelled and it's prot, protection. Uh, it is actually port on the PCB. <laughs> But uh, again, on one end of the, of the PCB says prot, on the other one it says port. So uh, I'm assuming that that's the protection. And what is he doing? It's on the base of this transistor going to ground and basically grounding the standby pin. Now the standby pin is basically getting, uh, is coming from here. There's a Zener diode at 5.1 volts, which is going some, through a capacitor, a couple of diodes, and then it gets the um, basically voltage from the transformer. I think it's like eight volts. AC or something like that. It's a small voltage from the transformer. So it looks like the protection signal is grounding standby, which is normally 5.1 volts. You can see here from the Zener diode, sorry. It's grounding standby. And this is how the electronics know I need to put the unit into standby. And let's see what we get on pin 18. So this is actually in standby right now. So if I power it up now, and I don't know, that doesn't look like the five volts. It is five something pick, but it's not very flat. And I'm assuming if this chip here is expecting low as please shut down, something like this is probably causing the unit to go into standby. Looking at the schematic here, there are two diodes. There's a small capacitor, then there's a little resistor, another resistor, a Zener diode. And, and then it goes into standby. Now the Zener diode should be able to smoothen up that voltage unless the voltage is wildly um, uneven. I'm assuming this can only be the capacitor. The capacitor is not doing what it's supposed to be doing. And there is C111, which is, you can see, it's the 3.3 microfarad 50 volts. And yes, that's the only 3.3 microfarad I replaced. So I would say I'll need to take a look at the PCB and see whether something happened, because obviously it wasn't doing this before. So that would be a clue that something went wrong with that capacitor, or either that capacitor is bad, or I did something wrong with the soldering. And a first check with my Fluke, it actually, it's actually reading 3.24 microfarad. So it looks like the capacitor is correct. Uh, well, it was working. You know, this is a very simple circuit. It's it's a, it's a, um, AC coming in. There's a brake rectifiers. Rectifier. These are the two diodes. Uh, that's the transformer. These are the two resistors. That's a Zener diode. It must work. It's not working. There's something wrong with it, and uh, I need to have a look at that. So I will have to remove the motherboard again, and the board is out. Now, I hope you realize, and you know, I could edit out this whole part but i have decided to share this with you because I, I feel i don't know i think it's funny well i guess when you replace capacitors you really want to remember to solder all the legs <laughs> well let me let me think about the you know very quickly the upside of this i have created a problem obviously because i forgot to solder that leg and I have identified where the problem was coming from, looking at schematics and everything. I found the problem, okay, must be that capacitor, There's something wrong with that capacitor, without knowing that that was the capacitor replaced. And, and here they are, you know, I, was, I basically tested myself unintentionally. This is amazing. <laughs> Right, everything is back in place and uh, I'm going to power it up again for the first time. So I don't know if it's working or not. Just remember the, um, well, one amplifier board is still disconnected. I got the oscilloscope and I'm going to probe these um, standby line to see, to make sure that this time it is not pulsing. Right, in three, two, one. Well, it's still not great, huh? That's much better. Ooh, it's staying up and there is no noise. Have I fixed the thing and I broke the amplifier board? That's very disappointed, but again, it, it gives me a chance to, to work on this a bit more. And here I've got my signal generator, which is input in the center channel, which is one done by this board here which is, should be connected. I've managed to select DVD-A, which is the multi-channel input, analog input of this amplifier. And look at that. Hmm. 
So it is working and it's not making any noise. This would be fixed now. <laughs> if it wasn't by the minor fact that I broke this board. Um, and uh, so yeah, this is not finished. Um, it would have been finished, but no, um, it's not finished. Uh, I still now need to fix the power amplifier board, which is not working anymore. Yay. Right, since the uh, the buzzing noise is gone, and I honestly wasn't expecting that, and everything seems to be working, I guess it's time to try and diagnose this board here. So the first thing I want to do is, with this board disconnected, I'm going to have a look at the, the three signals, which um, basically can cause the amplifier to go into protection mode, which is the protection line itself, which is in turn derived from the, the voltage de detection and the current detection. You know, I just want to compare what happens with the faulty board um, disconnected, which is right now, and with the board connected to see what changes, what is causing the protection line to come high. We know the behavior of the protection line already, so let's move on to the next one, which is the current detection. And I'm reading 53.6, which is basically V+. It's what goes to the amplifier. Finally, we have voltage detection, which is more or less zero. I can see from the drawings that voltage detection is basically, probably has a name in electronics, but I can see it's the output of a channel with the resistor and they just go all together, they just mix all together. So the more voltage you have on a channel, the more voltage you have after the resistor. So the fact that it's reading 0.003, it means that out of those three working channels, all together after the resistor, you have this, this voltage. Now, as a reference, I would like to check the voltage out of one of the working speakers. So center channel, for example, which is running at the moment. I mean, there's no, there's no output, obviously. As you can see, it's reading 0.001 volt on the center channel. So it must be more or less zero. Now let's switch off the amplifier. Let's plug the faulty amplifier board back and let's see what happens. In, we, we have only a few seconds before the amplifier goes into protection mode, but let's see what these pins read and then maybe we can check the speaker outputs as well. Here we are, the faulty amplifier board, which is this one is reconnected. So let's do exactly what we've done before. Uh, let's go on and check the current detection, which was 53 volts earlier on, power on now. And it's still the same voltage, it hasn't changed. And finally, let's check the uh, voltage detection. Let's try and power up. We got minus 0.7. Now, as much as it's not much, but that's telling me there's something wrong, because again, it should be really zero. So the next step would be if there's any voltage coming from any of those speakers. Back surround right output. There you go, it can actually stay there. So let's power it up and see what we get before it switches off. Oh wow, <laughs> we have the full 52 volts, minus 52 volts by the way. If we had a speaker connected and then there wasn't a protection mode, the speaker would just go bang in a second. So let's move on to the next speaker, which is front right. Yeah. Oh no, actually, that's interesting because it reads something, but then, then, then it more or less goes to zero, but you can read something now. So let's move to surround right and power up now. And we have again minus 51. And finally back surround left, power up now. And we have the same minus 52. So yeah, that's definitely, that's definitely uh, an issue with this board we have V minus coming out of the speaker. I guess the next step would be to remove this board and start probing around. Again, the, the upside is this board is completely um, analog. Uh, there's no digital stuff. It's all discrete components. So hopefully it's going to be kind of easy. I don't want to say easy, but kind of easy to, to troubleshoot. I will have to remove the whole block so I also have the other board, which I can temporarily detach from the heatsink uh, for comparison. So it, it could be an easy thing. I have a feeling, if you allow me, that this is gonna be expensive. <laughs> and one thing with this, um, with this uh, faults is it could be that you have more than one fault. Uh, finger crossed, again, I, as much as I'd like to repair this thing, I don't wanna spend too much money on it, but uh, that's definitely something I'd like to fix as I broke it apparently, so.
when the amplifier board is out, I have to admit I start liking this design. It's not, it could have been much better, but I have to say, you know, if you want to do the same on a, on a Nonkyo or on a Yamaha, it's just not possible. You can't remove the amplifier or if you, it's usually connected to everything else in, in a weird way, while in here, I have to say, you know, there's a little bit of serviceability where they allow you to remove the amplifier board and maybe replace it or fix it or something. And I have now removed the amplifier board from the heatsink. You can see you got all the main transistors in the back and the uh, pilots or drivers. I mean, as you can see, there's no like digital electronics or DSPs or anything. This is a pure amplification board. You got the plus and minus volt coming here. You got some extra signals like the, I think that the muting signals, the, the actual audio signals are coming through here. So um, it should be, fixable i mean there's nothing nothing that can't be replaced and as you can see this is a four channels board so this is one two three and four channels and each one of this section it's basically an independent amplifier so my goal now is basically to i'm looking for a short number one because i have 50 volts out of the amplifiers after the transistors that would be what i'm looking for i'm also i can also compare this board to the other one which is on the other heatsink or I think this is the right channel where it should be this, uh, this section here. I feel this is working and I can compare these components to these components or these components or these components. And so let me do some off-camera poking and then I'll come back to you and tell you what I found. Right, it didn't take me too long. Now good, the good news is the, the main transistors um, are not shorted. Uh, which is good news because they can be expensive, especially on some old stuff. Um, what I found, again, as you can see, like this is the back surround right and this is the front right. So I can compare these two because I feel that this is, this is working. And I found Q608, which is this one, which uh, shows a short on the middle leg. I uh, don't know which is which, to be honest, I didn't check, but anyways, and if I check the, the same capacity as basic uh, transistors, basically I got Q608 here, and on the front right is Q408. They're both 08, and it's just the, the number of the amplifier changes, so they just change the, the first digit. And if I check the middle, uh, so if I check these two legs, I have a 0.7 uh, voltage drop. I'm in uh, diode mode but I don't have a short as I have with this one. Now the same is the 602, which, uh, you know, is very close to 608. So maybe I'm reading the short, maybe one, only one of these two is short and they're somehow linked together. And it's the same legs, but if I check the front right, I get, again, at 0.7 voltage drop, uh, but nothing more. And obviously, again, if I, uh, take the QX02 as a reference, which is fine on front uh, right. It's uh, shorted on this channel. It's shorted on this channel. And it's shorted on this channel. So it feels consistent that this channel, which I feel is working, is not showing a short, but this one, this one, and that one are showing a short. Uh, well, I need to order some transistors anyways, but for now, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna desolder these two and test them in my little component tester uh, or with, with my multimeter and see whether they're actually shorted or they're working or this may doing something wrong. Right, time to test one of these. They are identical transistors. So let's see what my, my tester here says. Uh, well, it says two diodes. I think it should say transistor. Let's try the other one. Oh, okay, so this is working. So probably the short I was reading was from this one. This seems to be working. It's a PMP transistor. So I've removed the test of them all, and it turns out the only the one, the transistor ending with uh, 08, is, uh, was always faulty throughout all the channels be besides the front left. But there was one channel, can't remember which one, which had both the 408, well, the, the 08 and the 02. 
faulty. I'd better replace them all because I have a feeling that if both manage to fail on one channel, probably these two, these two small survivors, they're not very healthy. While I was checking things, I thought I found something weird with the muting transistors, which are basically muting the, the signal, incoming signal, and uh, they are in a completely different place, they're not getting voltages from the, the connectors I worked with, so it was a bit weird, so I decided to remove one or two to take a look. So that's how it should read. It's, a, it's an NPN transistor, I can see on the schematics it has a, a built-in bias resistor, that's it, it only has a, a bias resistor connected to the, to the base, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and look at that, I've got all the others from the other channels, which are either reading something weird, like two resistors like this, or two dials like this, or even unknown component like this one. Now, I did notice I feel I have the same problem on the other board, so this might be my, you know, um, earlier issues with the voltage regulators that probably, I don't know to be honest, or maybe they were faulty uh, by themselves, maybe that's the reason why this thing was sold for 10 pounds. I have absolutely no idea, but I will have to replace them. So I have replaced the faulty transistors. Now, I'd like to avoid to put this back on the main uh, heatsink and into the AVR. It's gonna take forever and if still it doesn't work, I have to take it back again, take it out again. So what I've done, I have installed some small heat sinks on uh, each of these transistors, including the driver transistors. Uh, reason is I would like to power this board outside of the AVR uh, without the Trans the heatsink connected, and in, in order to do so, I'm going to use this. This is a little contraption that I made, and this is used to be an Onkyo transformer, so it has the output I need, because I need a bipolar uh, supply, so I need plus and minus. This is very simple, it's going into a bridge rectifier, into the capacitors, I have some bleeding, bleeding resistors, so um, if I don't have anything connected to the output, they don't stay at stupid voltage for hours. And basically I have, um, like, um, let's call it ground or common, and then I have plus, plus 54 volts and minus 54 volts. That's why I've got the heat sinks on the transistors. I'm not gonna feed any signal at the moment. Uh, it's only gonna be for a few seconds, but just in case the bias voltage is set too high for whatever reason, I'm not gonna burn anything. Okay, we're ready for testing. I've got the amplifier board connected to my uh, power supply and my multimeter is plugged into one of the outputs. I think it's one of the back surrounds, which previously was reading minus 50 volts or something like that. So I will power up the board very briefly just to see what the multimeter says. And I got my extra multimeter here. This is measuring minus uh, V minus, uh, you know, just to see what's going on, whether we have something coming out of it. Three, two, one, go. So yeah, that's minus 50 and there is no output. So that looks great, power off. Let's check the other channels. Yeah, no output and we are up 50 volts. That is great. Then let's move on. Next channel. Voltage is up and there's no output whatsoever. That's interesting because that goes to zero completely. And this happens to be, yeah, that happens to be the, the front channel. So something is telling me that something else is slightly wrong. Because again, the front channel, as you can see from here, when I power up, it goes down to zero, zero volts, which is what you would expect from a very working amplifier. While the other channels are reading very little, but they are reading something. But it looks like, you know, we are definitely going in the right direction. Right, before I continue with speculations whether the offset is correct or not, um, I just thought I would do a quick test. So I got a speaker connected to one output and I'm injecting here uh, 1000 Hertz uh, from my uh, signal generator. I also have the oscilloscope connected to see whether we got something coming out. And uh, yeah, let's just test it. Three, two, one, go. And we do have sound. So that's great, it seems to be working, um, that's great. Now, before I can put this back into the unit, I need to replace the muting transistors. 
Now that's the mutant transistor I'm looking for. Uh, it's basically an NPN transistor which um, has an integrated bias resistor of 5.6 kilo ohms. Now I can't find this online anymore, so I've ordered some standard NPN transistors and basically just put a resistor on the base of the transistor itself. So it's the same thing, it looks a little bodged, but again it's kind of elegant at the same time. So that should work. I will uh, fit them in and then I would like to test them before I test them in the unit. Okay, let's test those muting transistors. So I got the board, the amplifier board, uh, connected back to where it was before with the signal, a uh, one kilohertz signal coming in, everything is connected. And I have my bench power supply set for 3.3 volts. Uh, the idea is to inject 3.3 volts on the base of the muting transistor. That should cut off the signal going into the relevant amplifiers. I have grounded the, the power supply because it's floating, uh, it's a floating supply, so I grounded it so it has a, it's on the same ground potential. I'm going to make sure it still plays some sound and then enable the voltage and see whether when I send the voltage, the output should stop. This voltmeter for convenience is measuring the voltage going into the mutant transistor. So we can see when, the, when I enable the power supply and when there's voltage going into the transistor. Three, two, one, go. Okay, let's enable the mutant transistor now. There you go, it works. Off, on. It's working, so I guess it's time to put it back together and put this back into the unit. Here we go, everything is back in one piece, I hope. Without wasting too much time, let's give it a go and see what happens. Both amplifier boards are plugged in and let's give it a go. Three, two, one, go. Okay. It's not shutting down. Ooh, so the speakers are connected. Everything is powered. Both amplifiers are connected and the unit is, stay, is staying up without shutting down. That's something. Right, moment of truth. I have connected surround right, which is one of the channels amplified by the board that hopefully I have repaired. Got my signal, signal generator running. Let's power it up, see what happens. Power now. Initializing. And look at that, it's working. Does the mute work? Well, it goes down in volume, but yeah, it kind of works. So yeah, happy days. I guess now it's a matter of making sure that all channels work and then do some tests and make sure they actually work the way they're supposed to work. But um, I don't want to be too optimistic, but finger crossed, it looks like this is hopefully fixed. One of the final steps before I can consider this amplifier as fully repaired is to adjust the bias. Um, the bias or idle current, it is adjusted through this trimmer, this one per channel. So this is the one belonging to the box around left. Um, so what happens is I'm going to plug my multimeter to those two terminals there. And only when the amplifier is fully warmed up, I'm going to adjust this trimmer to read six millivolts, as is written here on the PCB and as is confirmed on the service manual. The main channels, for whatever reason, they need to be adjusted to 10 millivolts, as the PCB says and as the service manual says. So let's crack on. The unit has been on for 10 minutes. I can feel it's getting warmish. And uh, as I said, again, I, I had to move all the trimmers to clean them with the contact cleaner. This is reading, well, ignore the fact it's reading minus, it's just the, the terminal is the other way around. It's just there's really not much space to, to work around the terminal down there. So it's plus 0.6 millivolts. Let's uh, turn this down. To, I mean, it is in spec, but I can turn it down to uh, six. 
that's totally fine. So we've got 5.9. So let's move to the next channel. That's definitely way too high. Again, I've been playing with that. So that needs to go down quite a lot. And being a front channel, this is supposed to stay around 10 millivolts. There you go. And I'll, again, I'll check again in a few minutes time to make sure we're still roughly there. So all is good. Time to test this unit and see whether it actually delivers the 60 or 80 watts per channel that Arkham mentions on the specifications. And here we are for the final test. Testing all, all seven channels, it gets a bit complicated. You know, just for the um, purpose of this test, a couple of channels would be okay. So um, you're gonna use the usual suspects, front left and front right. I have this little uh, battery of um, 100 ohm, sorry, 100 watts resistors, eight ohms on a heat sinks. So I can run them for a little while before they, they burn. And I have oscilloscope connected to uh, both of them. You only see the, pur the purple trays, but actually they are yellow and purple uh, overlaid. So I've got the signal uh, going into the unit. It should be something around 700 millivolts, more or less. The unit is powered. And um, so the plan is to basically raise, raise the volume until you see clipping and see what the voltage is, RMS voltage at that level. And considering these are fixed resistors, they're not speakers, so these are eight ohm resistors, we can calculate the power delivered by the amplification stage. Right, so let's turn the volume up and see when this thing is going to clip. So going up, should trigger in a sec. There it is. Up, 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 up. There it is. So it stopped at 31.53 um, RMS. And if I'm seeing this right, 31.5 RMS at 8 ohms equals to 124 watts, which is pretty impressive. So um, I'm assuming that when you drive more than two channels together, it might go down to 80, ohm, uh, 80 watts, which is what Arkham are uh, specifying for this unit. Um, I'm definitely impressed. Again, you usually it's the other way around. <laughs> usually the manufacturer says, oh, my unit can do 200, and then you go and measure it's 100. But uh, yeah, it's very impressive that this unit is rated 80 watts, all channel driven, fair enough. And when I'm only running left and right, I get 124 out of it. Definitely, definitely impressed. It's definitely delivering what it says on the tin. One thing I don't understand of consumer AVRs is the sheer amount of heat they produce on the um, power supply unit. Onkyos are the same, to be honest. And uh, so it's about 25 degrees. It's, it's fairly hot for the UK, but it's nothing serious. If you think that this is gonna be uh, probably, well, closed and probably working in a small cupboard, um, potentially in a closed cupboard. I mean, when it comes to the amplifiers, I understand they need to generate heat, but this thing, I mean, if I keep my finger on it, it's a bit uncomfortable, okay? And if I'm checking with my thermal camera, you can see that those voltage regulators, they're going on the seven, they're going on 70 degrees. Uh, that I can't remember if it's the 12 volt or something, but that's 70 degrees. That's maybe not 70, but it's 60 something. That's the 5.6 volts, um, 70 degrees. Is that really necessary? Uh, that's a bit warmer, but it, uh, sorry, cooler, but it's still 60 something. And again, that is on its 70s. And again, there's another one there, which is fairly hot. 65, 67. Now, these two heat sinks are extremely hot. You have all these heat sinks all together. No wonder those capacitors failed. Now, they are kind of a questionable brand, fair enough, but obviously that capacitor in there, when this is closed in a, in a shelf or in a cupboard or something, and you run it for hours on a, on a warm day, that those capacitors there, they're gonna run at stupid temperatures. Um, no wonder whether the trace broke. Yes, I mangled this heat sink a bit, but probably, again, this trace is running, the, the, the bottom of the PCB is probably running at 60 degrees all the time. And again, this is open, completely fully open, with an air conditioning unit blasting cold air on it. I don't know, it feels wrong to me. I, what do you think about it? And not only is this area incredibly hot when the unit is, is open and the lid is removed, 
But Arkham, in their infinite wisdom, decided to design the lid so that this area is basically completely sealed. I mean, obviously, some air can escape from this side. There is some ventilation here on this on the right, but the bulk of the heat will stay here. No wonder that all those capacitors had failed. So believe it or not, this thing apparently needs a firmware update. Uh, now to get the firmware version, you hold on DVD and SAT, you push the DVD and SAT at the same time, and it says that the main unit is 3.45 and DSP is 1.12. Now I found online the 3.50 software version, while the DSP I think is already at the latest version. So to try and update this thing um, without risking too much, I went ahead and I installed a, a, a copy of Windows XP on one of my spare motherboards. So that was kind of a jump in the, in the old memories. Uh, Windows XP is up and running. I have the software installed. I uh, hopefully that this motherboard has an actual serial port. I have the software running. Now forgive me for not trying to install a screen capture on Windows XP. I, I really don't want to do that. I don't want to even think about that. So let's see. Let's see if we can program this thing. And this is my temporary setup. It's just a random motherboard I had, but it happens to have a real serial port on it. And uh, so let's plug uh, the serial port into the AVR and see if the software can talk to the uh, Arkham. Right, here we go. So let's uh, open the software. You have two options to the program, the main micro, micro well, programmer or the DSP. The DSP is already the latest version. So I'll open this. The file I need is here on the desktop. And it's this 280, which is a correct one, 350, perfect. Uh, select COM port, it should be COM1, yes. Put the AVR300 in programming mode by pressing RDS info and up at the same time. So it's gonna be this. Program requested, then I have to press OK, which is, where is OK? Oh, there it is. Program, so now it's in program mode. And all I need to do is to start programming. Oh, it is working. Erasing device, programming device. I don't really know what happened because it stopped doing it. It says hex file programming complete and it didn't reach 100%. Well, if I'm reading the instruction right, that message, uh, hex file programming complete, it's what you're expecting at the end of the program. Uh, it's just, again, it didn't reach 100%. Uh, there's no feedback on the actual receiver. It basically says to power cycle the receiver and it should work. So again, I'll give it another 10 minutes just in case. Uh, and then I'll have to power cycle it and see what happens. The moment of truth. Did it work? So let's follow the instruction, power off. That's a good sign. Okay, let's check the version. 350, yay. That's it. That's, uh, with like uh, 20 years late, we got this fully up and running, fully up to date, and uh, happy Arkham AVR 280. And here we are at the end of the journey. In the end, you know, it was uh, an easy repair. It was just a few capacitors. It's just that uh, for me, obviously it wasn't easy enough. So I unintentionally made it a bit more interesting and I totally enjoyed fixing my own damage. Uh, the, the good news is again, we have a fully functional unit here and hopefully I can find a home for it. I hope you enjoyed the troubleshooting, the whole video. If you did, uh, please hit the like button and also consider subscribing to my channel if you like what I'm doing. Thank you very much for watching. This is Tony of Tony359's Tinkering Shop. I wish you a great day and I'll see you on my next video. Goodbye.